Wait, what? I can do that? This is Eric Bell with Wait, What? Financial matters that matter for business and the people that own them. On this episode, it is my pleasure to have David Greenberg, principal and partner for Tax Group International, where he's been the principal and partner for Tax Group International for almost two decades with me today. My good friend and excellent collaborator. David is a tax attorney, simply put, but has several designations after his name that speak to his expertise. David, you have more letters after your name than I have in my name. I know you got your bachelor's at Boston University in finance and marketing, but I also note you have an USTPC, or our United States Tax Court Practitioner. You got your LLM at Thomas Jefferson University, your MSA in tax and accounting, at Bentley College, you are an enrolled agent, you have a CPAA, and have a PhD in business process management from Canterbury University. And as principal for TGI, you work on international corporate partnership and tax planning strategies, including extensive structuring of international holding companies and other structures for both inbound and outbound companies. Tax controversy work include substantial international tax related to subpart F, foreign personal holding companies, debt equity issues, dividend withholding, utilization of low tax jurisdiction, utilization of foreign tax credits, hybrid entities, and partnership tax issues related to the redemption, obligation, and allocation of partnership items, development of research and development credits. Thanks for joining us today, David. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. You know, David, you have added a tremendous value to several of my clients on many fronts, and they're all grateful for you and what your firm has done and your expertise. But today I wanted to focus on research and development credits or incentives. I've learned over the years that this is a specialized area. Not all firms or CPAs have the background or person power to execute in this space. These credits have been around since 1981, but I was surprised to learn that only 95% of the companies that qualify for them actually take advantage. And I want to ask you, could you share with me and the audience what research and development credits are or R&D credits? Uh, sure. In general, a research and development credit is a, a credit for expenses incurred by taxpayers for improving a process, for creating a product, for developing a product, or, or just improving how their business runs. And if the, if the taxpayer can capture those costs in a way that's acceptable to the IRS, there's a credit available equal to, to 20% of those costs. It gets some limitations against it, and it gets it down to about 6.5% of the cost will be the credit. But if you can capture the costs that any company uses to improve a product, improve a process, develop a product, or develop a process, um, it's eligible for the credit, assuming that they go through some sort of scientific method, which is which, which essentially means a process of experimentation as part of that whole process. With R&D credits, can you answer the difference between a credit and an expense against your income? Sure. An, an expense is a deduction. So if you have company X spends $100 on a, a salary of one of its employees, it can deduct that salary against the income. A credit goes directly against taxes. So if someone has a $100 credit, a, a company, it can reduce its taxes directly by $100. Okay, so a credit is a little bit better than, than I would say a deduction in many ways. Right. Okay. That's correct. David, could you tell me what some of the industries are that may qualify for R&D tax credits? Yeah, it, it's almost any industry, but, um, uh, you know, manufacturing, architectural, engineering, software, Food and beverage, retail, agricultural, construction, machine and tooling, film and entertainment, gaming, uh, even some hedge funds, brokerage firms, banking. Generally, anybody that's introducing new software or creating software for their business, uh, a substantial amount of those expenses will also qualify. I was wondering, could you elaborate on the manufacturing industry since that's one of the first ones you mentioned? Sure. Uh, examples of activities that are going to qualify in manufacturing are uh, product development using computer-aided design tools, 
developing second generation or improved products, tooling and equipment, fixture design and development, developing unique computer numerical control programs, designing innovative programming or programmable logic controllers, uh, designing innovative manufacturing equipment, prototyping and three-dimensional solid modeling, uh, designing innovative cellular manufacturing processes. And I mean, yeah, there, there's just a whole litany of activities that, that, that qualify in the manufacturing area, depending on the, um, uh, type of manufacturing that's involved. You know, David, I kind of want to step back, and I know I've said this earlier on, but it, it just seems like there's so many people that aren't taking advantage of this when they obviously could. Can you tell me what the reason is, you think, or why they aren't? In general, there's one overriding issue is people may not be familiar that the credit's even available. But the second issue, or probably the biggest issue, is in, you know, even even 10 years ago, it was a lot more difficult to take the, the credit with the IRS and get them to agree that the taxpayer had properly calculated the credit and substantiated this. And there's been several court cases beginning really in about 2008 forward where the IRS lost and it just became a lot easier for the taxpayer to document and substantiate these credits. And a lot of a lot of companies, you know, most, most of the big companies, Fortune 500, of course, they're all taking it. And anyone that has one of the big four accounting firms doing their work for them, you know, preparing the tax returns or auditing the company, they're all familiar with it. They take it. But that's, you know, maybe 10 percent of the taxpayers out there or 5 percent of the taxpayers out there, maybe even less. The rest of them have, you know, just regular CPAs or enrolled agents that are that are doing their work. And they're, they're just not as familiar with these rules. And if any of them are familiar with their rules, they think it's really hard to take it based on what the IRS is doing, you know, up, up to 10 years ago. Wow. You know, I know there are there's certain activities around innovation that may qualify you for R&D tax incentives. Can you discuss or give me some examples, let's say, for an architecture firm? Um, sure. For, for an architectural firm, it's generally going to be the design phase of the, the project. And an architectural firm, a lot of times, they'll have to go through several iterations of the design. And part of that is using either an engineering type science, an architectural science, or they're using computer science to develop the project. And so all the time they spend developing the project, qualifies for the credit. They just have to capture that time uh, and, and, and document it. Okay. And I want to skip down because you, you named a lot of different areas, but I want to skip down. I don't know if a lot of people know this. I know it kind of caught me off guard, but the software and technology space, can you give the audience some examples of software applications for an industry that may be eligible for R&D tax incentives but just don't know it, like a logistics company or somebody who's trucking or something like that? I mean, it, it's just any company that's using software as part of their business, and if they're either improving or developing that software, it qualifies. And logistics is a great example. You know, we've worked on some of the Fortune 50 companies for logistics, we're the biggest companies in the world. And, you know, they're obviously familiar with it, but, you know, some of them, because their technology and software systems are so massive, they'll have up to like $500 million. Or so the biggest one I worked on was they had $500 million in expenses that qualified for the credit. Wow. So I know manufacturing will qualify, but what about retail stores, you know, that are selling their goods? Can they possibly qualify? And, and, and if they can, in what way? Retail stores qualify. And generally it's in the either if they're, if they're making their own clothes, you know, they're manufacturing their clothes, the design phase of making the clothes, the time and expense there qualifies. Or, you know, a lot of times retail stores have massive warehouses. The systems they put in place in the warehouses for inventory picking or, you know, delivery schedules, but kind of like logistics almost, the time and expense of developing those systems qualifies. And even in, in a lot of retail stores, a great deal of time goes into just setting up the floors. And there's some math and science involved in determining the best way to set up the floors and where to display products. And all that time is going to qualify. Okay. You know, there's a lot of people that are developing land right now. I mean, there's tax incentives to do so in some of the, the places that have struggled over time. I was wondering, in, in terms of developing land, could a, could a real estate developer qualify for R&D tax credit, or would it be all the people that work for that developer? Or how does that work? 
it, it depends what they're doing. A lot of it gets outsourced, but a lot of the uh, the land developers, essentially, with the activities they engage in, they're qualified, whether the developer does it or they hire someone to do it, is the, just the design that goes into subdividing the land and, and creating the lots. And, you know, they have to, you know, provide for roads and they have to provide for parks. And all that is kind of architectural in nature, but it's just just dividing up the, the, the project before they start doing all the work to subdivide it and then sell it. All that time and expense generally is going to qualify. Okay. You know, David, I know there is a, um, a look back or a claw back where you can capture credits that may have been lost or not taken in prior years. You know, I believe it's three years on the federal side. I think here in California, it's four years, I believe. You know, how does that work? And is it four years in every state? No. Well, California, as I understand it, at least, has a four-year statute of limitations, so you can go back four years. But, but basically the way it works is the federal statute of limitations is three years. That means the government has three years from when you file your tax return to audit you and assess taxes and then try to collect them. So during that three-year period, you also have the right to go back and amend your tax return. So for federal purposes, you can go back three years to amend your tax return and take the credits. And for state purposes, most of them, I think, are three years. But I think California has a special carve out for its four year statute of limitations. But each state has its own uh, has its own number of limitations or years that you can actually go back. Yes, okay. that's correct. OK. You know, and again, David, I know this is a specialized area, but what's the first step if a client wants to get started with you? What, what do you need or what's needed to get started? You know, to get started. All we really need is their website or some description of their business and then some, you know, financial information. It doesn't have to be detailed, just what their sales are, their, their cost of goods sold or their other costs and their employee salaries. And once we know what they do and what their financial situation is like or how big or how small the, their numbers are, we can pretty much estimate what we think the credit will be. And one of the tools we use to figure that out is a publication by the IRS. Every year, the IRS publishes about, you know, statistics from three years ago, but they list out every, all the industries we've been talking about and the, the revenues and the expenses of the companies involved and the tax credits that they're taking. So it, it's pretty easy to get a general estimate. You know, there's a fair amount of detailed work on our part that comes after the fact to support and document the credit. But just to get a general idea, we just need to, you know, either their their website or a description of the business and uh, simple financial information. Some of it we can get off even Dun & Bradstreet to figure it out. Okay. And then one big question everybody wants to know is how do you get paid? Well, we do generally is we charge by the hour, but our, our rates are pretty high. And so what we do is we cap those rates based on a percent of the credit. And we say in no event will our rates exceed 25% of the credit amount that we develop and that is used on the tax return. Okay. So if you find them credits, you get 25% of it then, basically. Or our rates if that, that number comes out smaller. Okay. One of the each one of the two. Okay. So, David, you've gone through a lot with me. Is there anything that I've missed that you would like to share with the audience before we sign off? Or The only thing I'd, I'd point out is that it's just become a lot easier to deal with the IRS and get the credits. There's a case called Suter that came out about four years ago where the IRS had basically, or not the IRS, the tax court said, all you need to do to document a credit is have a list of your employees, a list of their job titles, and a list of their salaries, and then someone with knowledge of what they're doing allocate their time to activities that qualify for a research and development credit. It's going to be a supervisor of the employees or the employee themselves, and all they have to do is be able to describe what activities the employees engage in uh, that qualify, and then they estimate how much time they spend. It has to be a reasonable estimate, and that will satisfy the documentation requirements for the credit. I'll make it sound a little simpler than it is, but it just changed the rules a great deal because in, 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 you know before that, the IRS is trying to say you need a time report or you need the employees to sign off on exactly what's being allocated or what, how much time they spend, et cetera. And also in the software area, it got a lot easier. At, at, after 2010, there was this court case called Federal Express where the court held essentially if you're improving a software package or developing software, 
if you properly capture that time and expense, that will qualify. And before the IRS had, had all these tests about innovation and economic risk and cost, and the courts just said, no, we're done with that. And, and they just made it a lot easier to document the credits. Every business out there qualifies. It's just a question of being able to document how much time and expense are being incurred in research and development type activities. So this is, I mean, the way I look at it, David, this is an incentive that the federal government has put out there for you to engage in activities in the United States and do stuff here, hire people and keep people here versus taking things offshore. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Well, if there's nothing more, David, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and hang with us. If you want to get hold of David, please feel free to email me at eb at weight-what.biz. Thanks, David. Thank you, Eric. Nice talking to you. All right. Be sure to subscribe and listen to next week's episode on the LERP, or Life Insurance Retirement Plan, with Sean Bragdon of BGA Insurance. I didn't realize this is a tax-favored way to save so much money towards your retirement in the tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to on an annual basis, and you can pull the money out tax-free. So it should be a good episode. Stay tuned.